Good morning, welcome to Westwood. I'm gonna be your service leader this morning. Good morning, everyone. I want to make a land acknowledgement. We are gathered today on uh, stolen land. The Papas Chase uh, were overlooked when the, the treaties were signed. Westwood is very fortunate to have had wonderful speakers come in. One of them was Darlene uh, Misik, if that's how you pronounce her name properly. And uh, she's from the Papas Chase and gave us a good history, an accounting of their land issues and their uh, ongoing struggles. And uh, yeah, we're on stolen land. We'll just leave it at that. This morning's uh, service is about uh, truth and reconciliation. We have the calls to action at the front. The government is lacking in implementing them. Truth is an integral part of the whole truth and reconciliation. So the emphasis this morning is on truth. Welcome to Westwood. My name is David Williamson. I hope uh, you're all eager to hear Judith's uh, uh, talk this morning. I see we have a couple of new faces here. Welcome. Uh, we have online services archived. 
Judith has allowed us to uh, record this, so it will be saved for future uh, viewing um, in our uh, archive. We have a uh, uh, paper at the back for any new visitors that you can sign, and we'd be happy to send you uh, an email of upcoming events and services. Westwood is a compassionate Unitarian Universalist community where you are welcome to explore your spiritual beliefs and decide for yourself what they may or may not be. Where you are welcome, regardless of your gender, who you love, your wealth, or your education. Where reverence for the earth and belief in the dignity of every person inform our ethics. Where music is an expression of our joy. Worship brings us together to celebrate what is important to our lives and acts of justice are a symbol of our hope. Uh, Stephen Bell is our musician this morning. Our tech team is Bill, he's up on the Zoom. Hannah at the back and Carl, thank you. Uh, after the service, I invite you to uh, visit, chat and discuss, ask questions. Uh, and if you have questions about Westwood in general or Judith will be here to answer questions specifically. Judith, if you could please light the candle. so much. The opening words this morning come from Truth Telling. This was the uh, chosen book for the uh, Free Thinkers Book Club this month. The opening words are the actual opening words of the book. Truth Telling, it's important. At the watershed moment in Canadian history when the Truth and Reconciliation Report was issued, the Honorable Justice Marie Sinclair positioned truth as mandatory and a precedent for reconciliation, articulating the fundamental principle that without truth, there can be no reconciliation. Please join us in singing the song 318, number 318, you'll find in the hardcover book, I believe, uh, We Would Be One. Stand as you're willing and able.
At this point of the service, we're going to have our candles of concern and celebration. It's a cherished tradition we have at Westwood, where we can share happenings in our lives, both hard and joyful. If anyone has a candle of concern or celebration, you can follow Etta, who leads up. <laughs> uh, come on up and light a candle. No, I'm going to last uh, light one last candle for any concerns or celebrations which remain unspoken in our hearts. If you can join me in the affirmation, may the light of these candles inspire us to use our power to heal and not to harm, to help and not to hinder, to serve the spirit of truth in loving affection and trusting hope. Each week during the Sunday service, we take a few minutes to acknowledge the gifts we both bring to and receive from this compassionate community. Whether it's Sarah and her compassion, organized compassion, letter writing, uh, condolence cards, and, and other wonderful things that she does. We, uh, we are a compassionate community, and, and I'm grateful for that. Gifts of talent, time, and treasure are part of Westwood. Today, we are blessed with the musical talent of Stephen Bell, Thank you so much. As well as the gifts of time and service from those who plan, greet, coordinate our sound and video systems and clean up after. If you, if you wish to make a gift of treasure, the information for doing so is on the right-hand side of this slide. Please join with me as we sing. Teal Hymnal Songbook, uh, song number 1023, uh, Building Bridges. Please stand, please stand as you're willing and able to join in on this. Thank you.
So at this juncture of our service, I am so happy to introduce Judith. I have known Judith for a few years now. We met uh, when there was an encampment just off White Ave at the Lighthouse Park. Uh, there was a peace camp. A peace camp and uh, Judith was a very active individual and leader in that group helping to help the unhoused. Uh, that was five, six years. That was a while ago. Okay, time flies. I thought it was, I thought it was longer. For, you've done so much in the last three years that I'm aware of. Since then, uh, Judith has um, led the Bear Claw group here in Edmonton, which does work with the unhoused community and and people in need um i'm i'm grateful for that with with her efforts this is all part of the action taking action doing things not just talking about it but doing things she's uh recently acquired a trailer which is a full-on mobile kitchen with which they're going to be able to feed moving around using like a commercial kitchen on wheels to help out with the unhoused community and the hungry people who are on the streets so the trailer is on the streets going to them this is a, a huge project and i'm sure that that will be wonderfully received so on that note judith is going to share some of her uh history and what she's doing and i look forward to hearing what she has to say hi hi all thank you for hi at home thank you for having me today um so I just want to elaborate a little bit on that trailer. So how we got that trailer was um, during COVID, um, you might know that uh, there was a um, funds grants that were available um, to for um, uh, for the COVID um, response. And so we were part of that, of the COVID response. During COVID, um, our organization was considered a first responder um, because during that time, uh, unfortunately, our brothers and sisters living right on the streets were left out of the fold, quite literally, and the cold. The fold and the cold, <laughs> you know. So um, they were left on the streets um, while all the good citizens of Edmonton were tucked snugly in their little houses and locked away from COVID. Our brothers and sisters were left on the street uh, with no amenities open, um, no place for washrooms, no place uh, to access water. Um, everything was on a lockdown. Um, and so we recognized uh, this, uh, this really um, uh, travesty, you know, for, for human beings to be left out in, in a time of history where it was very um, a, uh, emergency, you know, in, in history. And we left a whole demographic of people out of uh, humanity out of compassion, out of, um, you know, out of the fold. So it was really horrible to see. I remember when I first started out there uh, during COVID, um, on our patrols, we were walking downtown um, and we would come across a lot of feces. And I was remarking to one of our volunteers, I said, oh my goodness, I said, I didn't realize so many people in the inner city had dogs because there were so many feces around and he, my, my volunteer, he said, no, Judith, that's not dog feces. 
And I was shocked. I was really shocked. It was horrible. And so um, even though we do have shelters, all the shelters were at capacity as well, had their own issues with COVID, so had to be on lockdown as well. And nobody could come and nobody can go. So there was a whole, uh, I'd say about 3,000 people left on the street without nothing during an em emergency during a precedent time in history. You know, it was very shocking. So we had to start. Um, at the time, I was working for John Humphrey Center for Peace and Human Rights, and I was a community coordinator. And um, we recognized what was going on. We had started like an online Facebook presence uh, to help community members um, with COVID. Um, and then we noticed that the people on the street. So then we started, um, I started what was called Bear Clan. Now Bear Clan was an initiative that started in Winnipeg. Uh, their headquarters is in Winnipeg and they uh, go on the streets and they serve uh, the uh, disenfranchised, um, the necessities of life. And so I started that here a chapter here and it went really really well for uh, the first year and then the second year we found out that um bear claw bear clan had gotten infiltrated by police in winnipeg they got on their board of directors and it was supposed to be an indigenous led initiative so for the arts for the police to go in um and not even uh, yeah, it was no good. So we pulled out of Bear Clan and we just replaced the N with the W because our brothers and sisters on the street always tell me that, oh, you've got your claws out. You're always fighting for us. So uh, it was a, it was easy just to say, you know, go from Bear Clan to Bear Claw. And we do the exact same uh, thing as Bear Clan did. So during that time, um, the government was giving out all this COVID money for these initiatives and they approached us and they asked us what we wanted. And I told them I would really appreciate a food trailer because um, we could feed the masses better that way and hot food too. So, um, because before we were just doing sandwiches and pastries and um, not very well, Alberta health at uh, the first year I was doing soup and bannock out of uh, little wagons. And uh, of course the news got a hold of that. And then we were on the news doing that. And then Alberta health got <laughs> saw, and they said, no, Judith, <laughs> you cannot serve hot soup out of a wagon because <laughs> that's a uh, bacteria soup at the end. <laughs> so we had to stop doing that practice. And that's why I wanted to get a food trailer so that we could uh, carry on in a, in, a, um, in a good way. And so the feds did um, give us uh, $90,000 towards a food trailer. Uh, my employee, John Humphrey Center, they um, put in the rest of the money. And so now, and it's been in the, a while in the making. So we finally got it for a minute there. I thought it was a figment of my imagination, but now, I mean, it's there. I can touch it, I can feel it. And I know that it's gonna serve Edmonton and our brothers and sisters and in a good way. So I'm very excited about that. Um, so what I actually came here to talk about, that was just a food trailer. <laughs> So what I actually came here to talk about is um, uh, genocide, um, the effects of genocide on, a, on a generations. So I always like to uh, start off with um, the Convention of Genocide was a document that was made after World War II because at the time, the uh, leaders of the world got together and uh, said that, what are we gonna do in the future that the, the uh, travesties 
of World War II, of how um, the Jews faced their genocide and, and um, you know, how are we going to stop that? And so all these countries got together and they made uh, the Convention of Genocide document. Now, at the time, that was in 1945, I believe it was, and it wasn't enacted until 1948. But at the time, guess what? Canada and the United States did not sign initially on that document. And I, it's my opinion that it's because they were knee deep in, in genocide at the time. But with political um, and, and probably uh, from good people pushing, saying that you've got to sign it. And now Canada and the U.S. have signed that document. But uh, so I always start off with Article 2 of the Convention of Genocide. And Article 2 is, it reads, in the present convention, genocide means any of the following acts committed with a tent, intent to destroy in whole or in part a national, uh, ethnic, ethnical, racial, or religious group as such. A, killing members of the group. B, causing serious bodily or mentally harm to members of the group, deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part, imposing measures intended to prevent births within the group, forcibly transferring children of the group into another group. All of these A to E of Article 2 Canada is guilty of to the indigenous people of this land. And I, um, I will tell you that, that uh, every one of these has happened in my family. I found out um, so I brought Kleenex because I always cry, <laughs> but, um, so, um, I'm, um, I was E forcibly transferred, uh, to another group. So I am a child of the 60s scoop. The government came into the Northwest Territories, into uh, the small settlement of Salt River First Nations. And they took uh, my mother's 10 children that day. And I was the baby. So I was only six months old when that happened to me. And um, my other um, siblings were way older. And so um, when the government took me, um, I couldn't go to residential school, obviously, as a baby. Uh, so they put me in a receiving home in the Northwest Territories. And um, that's funny because <laughs> that they call it a receiving home uh, when it, actually it was an orphanage. But because they were taking so many children so fast in the Northwest Territories, they called the homes uh, receiving homes because they were always receiving children. Right. And so when the uh, receiving home was full or when there were uh, no more um, foster homes for me to access, um, then I was put in residential school because there was always room at the residential school. And uh, so um, I, and back in those days, it was the practice of the government um, not to put you back into your home community, 
because they really wanted to break up the family dynamic, in my opinion. So I didn't, uh, when they took me away, they moved me away from Fort Smith, uh, Salt River, which is the settlement. And then Fort Smith is the little town around by the settlement. And so they moved me away um, to Hay River, to Fort Providence, to Fort Simpson, um, uh, to Pine Point, all over the north instead of my home, um, probably because then I wouldn't um, find family, right? And uh, it was funny because years later, um, when I did really find my family, I found out that I was in the receiving home with uh, my cousins. And I remember my cousins because they were, they were a family in there, you know, nobody had any families. We were all like orphaned children, it seemed. And but my cousins, they knew that they had a brother and they had a sister with them. You know, there was four of them and they all knew that they were they were brothers and sisters. So I was always so jealous of them um, when I was a child and I and we would fight all the time because, you know, I was jealous. And so we that was we remembered that when we um, finally met as adults. But, you know, it would have made me, it would have made such a world of a difference to me as a child to know that I did have family. Because that was one of the things that, that really, um, that shook me growing up was, you know, one of, one of, um, one of a memory that I have is when I was in a crib, a wooden crib, um, was in this room with other wooden cribs and other little babies and that whole room was crying you know and probably missing their families too and uh so it would have made a difference if i had known that i had family growing up but the government kept that away from me they they killed that in me so um because there was no rooms at the receiving home and then they couldn't find a foster home for me when i was four years old i found myself at the receiving home i mean at the residential school and um, I remember, I got to take off my sweater. I remember um, going into, uh, getting into the school and uh, there were wooden stairs going up. The building was green, like hospital green, you know, that green. And uh, it was all wooden. And when I went in, uh, there was nuns and priests and uh, the nuns took me and of uh, the other kids and and uh, took off all her clothes, cut her hair, um, bathed us vigorously, <laughs> like, like um, and then uh, gave us new clothes to wear. And then um, we were allowed to uh, um, walk around in the receiving home and I mean the residential school. Um, but. Uh, it was a terrible place. And while I wasn't there too long, while I was there, um, the big kids used to tell me, um, whatever you do, don't go into the bush. And so I'm a four year old little inquisitive little child. And uh, this one day while the nun had her back to me and we were in the playground because the residential school was here and there was a playground in the back and while we were in the playground because we couldn't go to school during the day because we weren't old enough so there was a whole bunch of kids that would just board there like me and we'd all play in the playground while the kids were in school and so while that was going on the nun had her back to me and uh I thought, well, geez, I'm going to find out why I can't go into the bush. 
So I crept into the bush and uh, I could hear some voices. So I got on all my, on my uh, belly and started crawling with my arms into the bush closer to the sound. And uh, I look, I came up to where the sounds were and I look and I see two of the priests and they had all the little kids lined up in a row and some were naked and some were still had their clothes on. And uh, all I remember is that um, the kids were crying and the priests were yelling and uh, I didn't know what was going on. And so I jumped up and I said, stop it, what are you doing? And the minute I did that, the priests, both of them just looked in my direction, just like that. So fast, everything happened so fast. And the minute they looked in my direction, they just stopped everything and ran right towards me. I was petrified. I just got up and I turned around and I ran exactly the way I came into the bush. And I was very lucky that I ran. Once the bush was cleared and I was in the playground area, I ran right into the dress of the nun. She must have seen my face, how scared I was, because she grabbed me and she put me behind her dress and held me there and stood up to the priests uh, when they came running out of the bush. I don't know what she said to them. I don't know what happened. All I know, I mean, I was petrified. I swear that uh, I saw the devil in those priests. You know, I remember those black piercing eyes, uh, how fast they ran after me. It was very scary. And um, so the nun took me and she brought me to the nun's residence. And uh, she said, don't worry. She said, You're, I'm gonna take care of you. You're not ever gonna go back there again. And she said, I'm gonna write this all in the big book and they will pay for it one day. And so then uh, I think it was a couple of days later or however, I left there and I never ever went back to residential school ever. And then shortly after that, the government shipped me out to Montreal, Quebec, uh, where I grew up in Montreal because I was uh, adopted. They had adopted me out to a single mother here in Quebec. Um, she was a, a um, she was a, a uh, she adopted four of us little children. Uh, all us four little children were all 60 scoopers. During that time, it, um, I, I hate to say it, but uh, that's when like Wednesday's child was there. You know, you could pick up a newspaper and there would be little pictures of indigenous children. And can you adopt this person, you know, type of thing. And that's what happened to me. So Miss Gale had seen us. Uh, from Quebec and uh, and adopted uh, four of us. So two of us were um, me and Laurel, and we weren't biological, but we were uh, just a year apart. And then Michael and Lee, um, who were biological. And so Lee was the youngest and Michael was the oldest. And Michael was the oldest out of us. He was the oldest. And uh, out of the four children that Miss Gale uh, adopted, um, I'm the sole survivor. Oh, uh -huh. am I, am I good for time? Wow. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. Okay. And so, um, so, uh, Miss Gail was not a very good mother. Uh, we ran away from her at an early age. Um, I started hitting the streets of Montreal when I was 12 years old. 
And uh, I found more love on the streets than I found in that house. So it was, um, even though uh, I will tell you that um, Miss Gale uh, was a professor at McGill University. She was a historian. Um, she uh, can, can, came from England um, and uh, she was well to do. Um, her father was hum Sir Humphrey uh, Gale. Uh, he was in the World War, all three of them actually, uh, from England. And um, so she had, you know, quite some money. I went to a private school when I first went to school in Montreal, Sacre Coeur, which I loved. And um, so it wasn't all bad, you know, but I tell you, it was bad. When it was bad, it was really, really bad. Uh, but when it was good, it was really, really good too. You know, like I enjoyed the boarding school. But um, so I was the only sole survivor. Uh, Laurel, shortly after I ran away, Laurel started running away as well because she couldn't take it either. And so she was a year younger than me. And Laurel ended up getting murdered in Montreal. And so that's who I lit a candle for today. I always light a candle for my sister, Laurel. Yes. I really, um, Laurel was a 60s gooper too. And what was sad about Laurel is that she was never ever able to uh, find out her biological family. She grew up not knowing who they were where she came from her ancestors or nothing like that so it was very sad for laurel and then she died and so her none of her people like on this earth know uh, and i don't even know her real family name um i don't know any of this kind of information but i loved her very much she even though she was a year younger than me she always took care of me you know she was always always so concerned with me so and then um michael who was the oldest when he turned 18 he was allowed to find out uh, who his biological family was and uh, he found out he was from uh, Hay River in the Northwest Territories as well. So he went up there uh, to search for his biological family. And while he was there, he was there less than uh, six months. And um, he died of he died because he he was basically an urban Indian by this time and did not grow up in his culture. So he, uh, when he went back home, he went out duck hunting and got lost in the bush and he died of the element of the elements because he just didn't know how to survive in the bush. And so, and Lee, uh, who was the youngest, he died of alcoholism in Montreal. And uh, what's really sad about all of this is that Ms. Gale um, takes no responsibility for anything. She actually... Uh, left Canada and uh, bought a villa in Spain, and that's where she's retired. And oddly enough, uh, she's writing children's books. Yeah, which is really horrible. But, um, and so when I finally uh, reached, reached of age, I was allowed to find my biological family and find out my culture and where, because I always, I always grew up, you know, not knowing that I had a father or a dad. When I was a little child, I always was told by every adult that I came across that, you know, I'm, the government's your, your family now. You know, I always thought I was a child of the government. I really did. I thought I was a child of the government. And I mean, the government fed me, the government clothed me, the government gave me allowance. I remember they used to give us 25 cents and we would pile it up in little pill bottles, you know, and then when we'd have like $2.50, we can go swimming and for ice cream. After. <laughs> yeah. 
it was um and uh so when i finally ventured to the northwest territories to find my biological family i was very uh happy to find out that my granny here um she uh was a bushwoman and as all my family were they all were bush people um they didn't live in the settle they lived in the bush and so granny's uh camp in the bush was sought after all over the north everybody that went hunting and everything would stop at granny's camp and she fed everybody so i was very happy to find that out because you know i that's part of what i do now is i i take care of uh, of uh, our brothers and sisters and we try to feed and clothe and give our brothers and sisters the necessities of life just as my uh, granny did and just as her granny did too you know that's how um indigenous people the dene in the northwest territories they took care of of one another always in a good way and so um that's why uh I, when uh, my boss, Renee, came to me that day and said, do you want to start something like that here in Edmonton? I was like, yes, that's exactly what I want to do. That's exactly what I can do. And so um, it evolved, though, uh, Bear Claw evolved. Like I said, it was initially Bear Clan, and then it went to Bear Claw. And then once I was out there on the street, I recognized that there were so many uh, indigenous brothers and sisters there who had almost the same story as me, you know, growing up as a child, as a, and uh, learning all about, uh, this, uh, my history and stuff. I, I always thought that I was, I was the only one. I honestly thought that I was the only one. And then as I got older and finding about the 60 scoop and finding about like it happened to a whole generation, 150,000 plus children and all the hurt and pain that I went through. And then I have to multiply that by 150,000. This is the great travesty of the Canadian government that they inflicted onto indigenous people. And that's the genocide. Right? Am I, how am I doing with time? Okay. <laughs> um, and so um, I was happy that I did finally go up north and I, and I met everybody because really that was the missing link that I, I lost all my life. Um, the government took my name because my my birth name was uh, Judy Lupini. But when they shipped me out to Montreal, Quebec, they changed it to Judith Gale. So the government stole many things from me. They stole my family. They stole my name. But the one thing that they were never able to steal that I found out I said they were never able to steal my ancestral right as an indigenous human being on Turtle Island. And so that's where I bring my strength from now. And I know that creator made me for a reason, just like he made each and every one of you for a reason. And that I matter too, and, and that I walk with my ancestors every day. And that's something the government has never been able to steal from me, is my ancestors. And so I bring, that's where I get my strength from now. And that's why I'm able to um, do the work I do now, um, is because I've had the lived experience. I've, I've, um, I know right from wrong now. And so now that I know better, I do better. And um, I'm very happy that, you know, we have this organization that really does spread good love in Edmonton. Every time we hit the streets, our brothers and sisters always, always remark, for instance, we had a one of our older gentlemen, he said, you know, Judith, 
we get fed from the hope mission from the sally in even some churches he says but nobody serves up the kindness your group does and that's what we do we we are out there non-judgmental um we love everybody um and we get so much thanks and gratitude we're never met with violence we're never met with uh hate you know when we're out there um, with our brothers and sisters it's all about community and it's all about love and that's really what our brothers and sisters on the street i in my opinion that's what's that's what drives them uh to the street as it did for me as a adolescent when i you know i found more love on that street than i did in the home and that's what a lot of our brothers and sisters feel like too uh, but having said that um there are many things that i advocate for and one of them is housing first i really truly believe that each and every human being on mother earth um requires a home if you think about it creator has made so many beings on mother earth and we are the only being that does not allow our own a shelter. Every other being on Mother Earth can have a shelter, a home, a little spot for themselves. A fox, he has a nice little den. A bear has a cave. What do I? humans take shelter away from other humans and then we dare to call ourselves the smartest species so we're out there advocating for housing first it's a fundamental human right just as as uh the necessities of life is food water shelter clothing we all need those basic elements to get around in our life so i don't know why we want to withhold it from people you know because we are all equal and we're if creator has us here today if creator woke you up on this side of the earth it's for a good reason that's what i think so it's not up to anybody else to uh to uh, snuff that out so um and that's what in my opinion canada has been doing with indigenous people this ongoing genocide and it's still going to this day you know one of the uh, worst things out there right now on the streets in my opinion are our indigenous women our indigenous mothers the government right now are taking the children at such a fast rate and they leave the mothers desolate on the street. And it's nonsensical. This is the same thing as resident as what happened in residential schools where they the government took the children, put them in the residential school. Well, now the government is taking the children and uh, putting them in foster homes or away from their family again, and it's still going on. You know, every day mothers are coming up to me on the street, please help, how do I navigate through child welfare, taking my kids and leaving me with nothing? Not even, are they can't, once your child has been taken away apparently, and like it's really hard to get um, income support even. So that's why we have so many mothers on the streets. And it seems like it's always indigenous people. So I just can't help but think that the genocide is still ongoing. It's still ongoing. And we've got to put a stop to this enough is enough because we're all here for a reason and we've got to stop playing like yeah so um i'm just happy to say that even though that i lived all through this uh these i had a really bad upbringing at the first part of my life i'm 60 years old now 
And I'm happy to say every, I know who my family is now. And I, I, I lived all of those experiences uh, because I could make a difference today. I want to leave you with one thought, and that is about what I learned about powwows. So powwows, um, I went to uh, one of my first powwows, and all of a sudden, everybody was dancing, and uh, all of a sudden, the powwow just came to a complete stop. Everybody just stood still in their spot, and the, mu the drummer stopped. Everybody stopped. And I was wondering what was going on. And then all of a sudden, a, the stick man, he's the um, the guy that, I guess he would be like the commander or whatever, you know. And so he's the guy that dictates where everybody goes and stuff. So he, start, he goes and he gets an elder and then he leads the elder to a spot. And I look and there, there was a fallen feather from a regalia, somebody's regalia. Nobody knew who it was yet because they were all dancing. So um, what the elder did was he got some tobacco and uh, sage and he lay some tobacco down, picked up the feather very gently and then um, walked it over to a safe spot and said some more prayers over that feather. And then once that was over, the powwow commenced again. So I thought, wouldn't that be just beautiful if we could do the same thing for our fallen brothers and sisters? When we see a brother or sister falling into addictions, into houselessness, into, uh, into abuse, into uh, crime, into whatever, when we see them falling, I think it should be everybody's community right to pick them up and let them know that they're loved and pray over them and put them in a safe spot until they're better to be re to go back with their their regalia. You know what I mean? Yeah. So that's one of the beautiful things. I realize that my culture is beautiful. My culture loves everybody and everything. And that's something I can't say about every, everybody. But that's what I've learned in my culture. So thank you very much for listening. And I hope that, and if you have any questions, um, I'm an open book. <laughs> okay. You're welcome. <laughs> that was the long enough or whatever. I don't know. Okay. Stephen's going to have a another song for us here. If uh, we can just sort of contemplate what Judith said and think about the words.
Thanks, everyone.